When you have such a major support, it's gonna take more time than just a couple quick hits on this before it really breaks to the downside. So you have confirmed support and we confirmed Hello everyone, Gareth Soloway talks about Bitcoin and traditional markets, various stocks, and macro data to conclude what is set to happen in the near term. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. Bitcoin saw flash volatility on April 19 as geopolitical turmoil in the Middle East spilled into financial markets. Data from Cointelegraph Markets Pro and TradingView showed new seven-week BTC price lows of $59,630, hitting after the April 18 daily close. These accompanied renewed tensions between Iran and Israel, a particularly sensitive topic for Bitcoin this month which fueled a major drawdown from $70,000. As Cointelegraph reported, the day prior, a modest recovery had been underway, this swiftly undone as markets reacted to the latest developments. Amid rumors that the situation might not escalate further, BTC slash USD staged an equally impressive rebound from the lows, reaching local highs of $65,190. So what we have going on here, guys, is the S&P futures were slammed in the overnight. Israel striking back at Iran. Ultimately, it was very clear pretty quickly that this strike was so limited in scope to the point that, in, in fact, what I'm hearing is the Iranian government and the state-run news is not even reporting it as something that Israel has done. So again, very limited. This is actually a de-escalation if this continues on this path. And what we saw in the overnight, oil spiked higher, the S&P futures collapsed, even Bitcoin briefly went down, broke 60000 before recovering. And again, oil, which was up you know, 3 $4, to be honest, off of this initial news, is now back down again. And remember, interestingly enough, oil yesterday, I was talking about how it was due for a bounce. There was your bounce right there, 3 $4 bounce, and now it's back down. We'll look at that chart in just a minute. Okay, Netflix reported very, very solid earnings, great subscriber additions, but the key here is guidance was slightly light. Another thing that really kind of spoke to me was that they said they are no longer going to be telling us what their subscriber numbers are. And again, you know, their justification is essentially, oh, it doesn't matter because it depends on how much we're making off each subscriber. If a subscriber is paying the discounted version with ads or if it's, you know, it's, it's ultimately they're viewing it as not as important. I think they're doing it because they know their subscriber numbers are going to start to stall and that's a negative. It's always about, you know, when it's a good number, you want to report it, right? When it starts to slow down, you don't want to report it. And you can see the stock today is dropping. We're down about 6% on Netflix. We're going to look at this chart look at the technical levels. I do have a few technical levels, 573, which is basically right where we are right now, pre-market. And then we have 567 and 555 as the technical supports. American Express reported earnings, generally very good earnings. The high-end consumer continues to spend. They are, again, generally a high-end consumer credit card company. All right. Uh, lastly, Procter & Gamble falls a little bit on earnings and earnings beat, uh, but guidance, again, just a little bit on the weaker side. And by the way, just going back to Netflix, Netflix was up about 30% or so going into earnings since the start of the year. Remember, the higher a stock goes up into earnings, the higher the bar where if it's going to continue to go up, they have to perform. Very hard. There's a lot of stocks out there that have gone up so much in the first quarter of the year that when these companies report earnings, it may be a little tough for them to continue to see gains in their stock price. I want to start with the DXY and the dollar again, guys, still well in the zone of a breakout to the upside. So again, we had this bigger wedge pattern on the US dollar. We can see down sloping lines. We kept hitting, 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 and then we broke out, retraced to the scene of the crime. And then again, you get that move up. That's so common. In fact, if you watched these game plans for even just a month, and I've now been doing them for almost a year, 
But if you've watched this for just a month, how many times have we talked about a breakout with confirmation and then a retrace to the scene of the crime? Happened again on the dollar chart. Now, the question is how much more upside is in the dollar? Well, for me, a lot of this has to do with what about rate cuts or rate hikes? If the Fed remains hawkish, that will keep a bid under the dollar. If all of a sudden we see economic news starting to falter, then rates come down, the dollar comes down. The other thing that's driving the dollar higher is the geopolitical tension, right? There's no denying that when you broke out and you were in this area, this is when that escalation in the Middle East really started to take place. And again, that's been pushing the dollar higher. The reason why geopolitical issues cause the U.S. dollar to go up is because the U.S. dollar is a safe haven asset to much of the world. They rush into the U.S. dollar when things get scary everywhere else. Okay, so again, that's just a good little tidbit there in the charts as we continue through here. And again, we'll get into some additional charts. Looking at the 10-year yield, look at what happened here, guys. This is remarkable. So if we look at the 10-year, we knew we were in this, this channel, right? And channel, again, it means two parallel lines. So you have the parallel lines here, here, and then on the lower side right here. Now, what's so cool about this is that if we just go back to earlier this week, I said, guys, I think we're going to go to 4.7% on the 10-year, and then we're going to pull back. Sure enough, we hit 4.7% on the 10-year, and then we pulled back. In the overnight last night, when you had this stuff going on from a geopolitical standpoint with, with Iran and, and Israel striking back, we saw yields drop sharply right to this dotted line. Now, this dotted line might be harder for you guys to see, but the dotted line here is the midpoint of this channel. The midpoint actually has some power to it. In fact, what I mean by that is if you look at right here, right on that dotted midpoint, right? If you look at this point, this was right on the dotted midpoint there as well. And then again, if we go over here on the dotted midpoint there and right over here dotted midpoint. So the point being is that we retraced, and this would be, by the way, this would be a 50% retrace of the low of this line to this high. So you did a 50% retrace and then yield snapped back as obviously the escalation, it looks like it was more de-escalatory um, in terms of what was going on there. Meaning the strike again was very, very minimal concentrated to a point where, again, as I said, Iran, and from what I've heard, the state media, state-run media is not even reporting it, probably because they know if they report it to the public there, then they're going to probably have to act and retaliate back. And so this is a good sign that they're not doing that because it shows that they don't want to escalate the situation anymore, at least for now. Okay, so that's what we have on this. Again, if we did continue to come in, I think this zone down here around 4.35 is your level to watch on the 10-year yield. Going to the S&P 500, I've given you guys this level for many, many days, maybe even weeks. We knew that we broke this, this wedge pattern. Remember, when you break wedge patterns, it's usually a pretty waterfall event. And that's exactly what we saw here. So notice how controlled this was. Very much controlled, right? Just up, 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 getting tighter and tighter until price is forced out of that zone, right? It's like squeezing it, squeezing it, squeezing it. It has to pop out one side or the other. Upsloping wedges like this, generally, probability-wise, they break to the downside. What happens? You get the waterfall event, but you're going to start to hit support and buy the dippers are still lurking. So again, one of the lines I'm watching today, and again, there's no guarantee that this is the line that gets us a bounce in the markets, but we're looking at 497 497 on the SPY here, which is the S&P tracking ETF. So that's a level that I'm guessing hits today. I know the markets have recovered from their overnight losses. We're basically flat last I checked, but I still think you'll get a little bit of selling considering we're going into a weekend where, yes, things look like they're de-escalating in the Middle East, but you just never know. Two days where the stock market's closed, you just don't know what could happen. Look at what happened last week. And I think that at least pushes the market down a little bit during the day to at minimum tag this level. All right, on to a couple other charts here, guys. Let's quickly go to Tesla. Tesla, look at this recovery on Tesla pre-market. So Tesla was trading near 145. It's back to 149. I continue to like this chart. I got to be honest, the daily chart is not a bad chart. It has multiple supports. It also has a positive RSI divergence. And again, I, when, when the consensus is negative and to the point of everyone being negative, or at least in recent history, 
I start to look for these divergences, right? And so you have this, this, and this. These are all higher highs here, right? And then again, you look at the lows. The lows have been lower lows. And so that to me is a signal of accumulation where it doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna go back to all time highs. I mean, who knows about that? But in the very least, we should see some sort of bounce back up, maybe back to these recent highs around 170 or maybe higher. But in the very least, as a swing trader, I take note of the, the very negative vibe on the stock and then start sick looking for the positive signals in the technicals, which then tell me, maybe give me just a little bit of an edge to be on the cutting edge of a potential bounce in the stock, all right? We gotta look at Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, we saw it initially flush on fear, right? So the fear was, we had the escalation, potential escalation with Israel striking Iran. We dropped down right back to that technical support. We then bounced well off of it and are trading at 64,600. That's a great bounce. But again, if you remember what I talked about yesterday, we now have a confirmed support. So this is major support. So really you wouldn't expect it to break here. Like even though we hit it a couple days ago, when you have such a major support, it's gonna take more time than just a couple quick hits on this before it really breaks to the downside. So you have confirmed support and we confirmed this as resistance, right? So you now are essentially in this period where price, like I said, could go like this. And unless we break one way or the other and confirm, you're just stuck in a range. Like this is range trading to its finest in terms of Bitcoin. Now, again, we do have the halving that I think later today goes into effect. So we'll watch for that. Does that have any additional implications? The only thing I will say again is that the halving to me meant a lot more years ago because there was a lot more mining going on. At this point, I think we have 19 million Bitcoin already that have been mined. There's only a couple million left or even less than a couple million. So it doesn't have a huge impact on supply that's available to be sold versus what the public has, what the institutions have. And I think that's just something to remember is that for me, again, going forward, the mining, the, the halvings probably play a less and less significant role because you're not cutting down on the amount of supply by a massive amount because again so few coins are left in the system all right couple other charts here just quickly looking at ethereum um, what we can see on ethereum is that it hit again same thing same sort of technical level here here's your ethereum chart again we had our four thousand and change high up here we retraced back into this support we kissed it last night and we bounced a little bit off of that level this is the weekly chart by the way so it looks a little different but the point is this is your level to watch right here right around 2900 3000 if you confirm below this level you'll probably go into this zone here maybe 24 2500 but eventually this 1800 is a possibility but first and foremost you haven't broken below so as of now this is your likely, you, some sort of bounce is the likely factor here until you probably get into this zone. See these lows right here? See how those right there? So you have, you have upside probably to about 3,400, 34 and a half. And then again, the key support is 29 to 3,000 on Ethereum. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Gareth Soloway. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.